Governor, Dr. Subarao, Dr. Mahindra Dev, Dr. Sarkar, Mr. Pandit, faculty of IGITR, graduating students, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me congratulate IGITR for two unusual accomplishments. First, to have a civilized convocation without all those colonial relics of gowns which we have to wear. And second, for achieving uh, a remarkable gender balance. In fact, it's a gender imbalance the other way now. <laughs> and uh, I hope that you continue with this trend. Uh, and in fact, it's a trend now becoming increasingly visible uh, in education institutions of higher learning. So I congratulate all of you, but particularly the women who have graduated uh, this morning, and got degrees this morning. <clears throat> well, I came uh, to this campus to this uh, small, compact, but very nice, beautiful campus, uh, almost exactly 20 years ago, in December of 1992, when uh, the campus was still growing, the plans were still being executed, uh, and I stayed here for three days for a major conference on human development in the context of structural adjustment. And almost all the leading economists of uh, the country were present, some of them from abroad, uh, Mr. K. R. Narayanan uh, presided over many of the sessions. And uh, the net result of that conference, of course, was a book that came out on human development and structural adjustment, which was edited by Kirit Parekh and Sudarshan. So what I thought I would do is to revisit 20 years later the theme of that conference uh, and ask some questions in the context of our experience over the last two decades. So what I want to do is ask the question, what has happened to human development in the last 20 years? Since the last 20 years has been a period of very rapid economic growth, last two decades, average annual real GDP growth has been 7%, and draw some conclusions for the future as to what are some of the challenges that we face in the context of human development. Now, in the last 20 years, the decline in poverty uh, has been very real and very discernible. There has also been convergence in GDP growth, in GSDP growth rates, but there has been no convergence in income levels across states. That's not very surprising given the initial conditions under which uh, most of the states of India have operated. In terms of the last 20 years, three very powerful conclusions stand out from the growth experience at the level of the individual states. One, as I just mentioned to you, convergence in growth rates is definitely taking place. Second, there is no convergence in per capita incomes. But the gap measured by the Gini coefficient is certainly plateauing. There may be, as some scholars have pointed out, conditional convergence taking place. And also, very interestingly, the disparity between the highest per capita income state and the lowest per capita income state has also come down. So these are three very robust conclusions or three robust results that have come out of all analysis of interstate inequalities which set the stage for human development. One, convergence in economic growth rates. Two, no convergence in per capita incomes, plateauing of the gap, and a narrowing of the disparity between the highest per capita income state and the lowest per capita income state. The third and most interesting development in the last 20 years, often escaped public attention, is convergence in human development index. This is very interesting what has happened, that if you look at 91, if you look at 2001, and you took it to 2011, and the Planning Commission got out the human development report prepared by the Institute for Applied Manpower Research, which looked at the human development indices at the national level and at the state level. And what 
is remarkable is the convergence that is taking place in the Human Development Index. Now, it shouldn't be surprising, actually, that this convergence should take place, because much of the convergence is being driven by base level effects, because large parts of the country, particularly in the northern part and in the eastern part of the country, we're starting off at very low levels of human development indices, and therefore, any increase that they would show would show up in a very healthy growth rate. The second leap is very interesting, is amongst the three components of the HDI. As you know, the HDI has three components, the income component, the education component, and the health component. The increase in the education component has been so very significant that it dwarfs whatever retrogression they may have had on the income component or on the health component. And in fact, in state after state, because we measure the education component in terms of gross enrollment ratios, and the gross enrollment ratios have indeed grown up very, very substantially, even in the poorest states of the country. So what you're seeing is a convergence in the HDI, not because of the convergence of the income effect, not because of convergence on the health side, but largely driven by convergence on the education. Now, these are the three broad developments that I can see that have taken place in our country in the last 20 years as we moved to a higher growth trajectory. But at the end of 20 years, I have to admit that there are certain paradoxes on the human development. That is what I want to spend time today talking to you about. What are these paradoxes of human development? This is a paradox essentially of a rapidly growing economy not being able to show commensurately impressive achievements on human development. And as I will explain to you uh, why this is so. The first paradox, paradox number one, high growth states continue to show lagging human development and in some case worsening human development indicators. It's very important to recognize this. High growth states, high per capita income states, and high GSDP growth states continue to show lagging human development, and in some cases, worsening indicators. The most outstanding example of this is, of course, Gujarat. But there are other instances, surprisingly, which has escaped attention, both Punjab and Haryana, rich states, which in the last 20 years has slipped in terms of any comparative ranking of states and in fact have shown some worsening human development indicators most tellingly measured by the adverse child sex ratios. So Gujarat, Punjab and Haryana, to my mind, three states that exemplify paradox number one, which is rich states, high growth states, showing lagging human development, education, health, sanitation, nutrition, and in some cases, worsening human development indicators. Paradox number two, the richest states of India continue to have districts with the worst human development indicators. Normally, Ashish Bose has brainwashed all of us to thinking of Bimaru states. And we always tend to think of all the lagging districts to be in Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and UP. But the picture is considerably much more complex than this. And you find that in some of the richest states of India, some of the worst districts in terms of infant mortality, in terms of sex ratio, in terms of nutrition, and in certainly in terms of access to health facilities. And the two examples of these rich states which I can think of, in fact, three examples of rich states that I can think of, is Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh. The six northern Karnataka districts have human development indicators worse than that of sub-Saharan Africa. There are large parts of Andhra Pradesh which have worse human development indicators than neighboring Bangladesh. And there are some districts, particularly the tribal-dominated districts of Maharashtra, which have the highest rates 
of infant mortality and malnutrition. Now, these are by no means poor states. These are relatively high, in, in the case of Maharashtra, definitely a high income state. Karnataka and Andhra are certainly middle income states which are moving ahead. But these are also the three of the fastest growing states in the last 20 years. So paradox number two, therefore, exemplified by the experience of Maharashtra, Karnataka and Andhra is that the richest states continue to have districts with the worst human development indicators. Paradox number three, <clears throat> poverty ratios have declined. The extent of the decline provides intellectual fodder for MPhil and PhD thesis for economists. If there is consensus on poverty ratios, high unemployment rate amongst the economics profession. So it's inevitable that there's always a controversy surrounding what is the precise extent of the poverty ratio fall. But whatever the debate may be, we're not arguing about the trend. We're arguing about the magnitude of the fall. The trend is very clear. Poverty ratios, however imperfect the headcount ratio is, has declined considerably in the last 20 years in an environment where the growth rate has been 7% per year. But the paradox that I wish to draw your attention to is that in spite of the decline in poverty, malnutrition remains stubbornly high. Now, this is a big puzzle of human development, that whatever we seem to be doing, education, health, income, malnutrition levels continue to be stubbornly high. Now, there are some people who believe, Arvind Panagariya has written an article in the Times of India recently saying that our nutrition statistics are bogus. I mean, that's the, the normal reaction of any economist where facts don't conform to your theory. You immediately begin to call the data into question. But going beyond data limitations, I think it's uh, an important issue for us to accept that in large parts of India, central India, particularly the tribal belt of India, the 170 or districts of India, malnutrition levels measured by any international index that you take remains at a stubbornly high 40 to 45 percent. So 40 to 45 percent of children below the age of five continue by any index to be malnourished, even though overall human development indicators have improved, even though economic growth rates have improved, and even though poverty ratios have fallen. Fourth paradox, which I have already alluded to, is that human development indices across states are converging, even as per capita GSDP is diverging, or per capita net state domestic product, more precisely, is diverging. So what you're seeing is a convergence across states on the Human Development Index, even as there is a divergence across states in terms of incomes. And this, I have explained to you, is largely driven by improvement in the education component and not necessarily in the income or the health component of the Human Development Index. And the fifth paradox that I wish to draw your attention to is that judged in a regional context, so far I have been talking about comparison across states in India, judged in a regional context, Bangladesh has superior human development indicators at lower rates of economic growth and lower GDP levels. And the comparison of Bangladesh is not just with India, but it's a comparison of Bangladesh with West Bengal, Bangladesh with Gujarat, Bangladesh with Karnataka, Bangladesh with Andhra, Bangladesh with Assam. If you take this comparison, the economic growth rates in India have been considerably higher than the economic growth rates in Bangladesh, but Bangladesh has delivered superior human development outcomes, measured in terms of fertility decline, sanitation, and nutrition. 
So these are the five main paradoxes as I look at the data over the last 20 years. High growth states, high income states continuing to show lagging and sometimes worsening human development indicators, Gujarat, Punjab and Haryana. Richest states having districts with the worst human development indicators, Maharashtra, Andhra and Karnataka. Poverty ratios declining but malnutrition remaining stubbornly high across the tribal belt from Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha. Fourth, per capita NSDP diverging in an atmosphere, an environment of converging human development indices driven by improvements in educational outcomes. And five, in a regional context, Bangladesh demonstrating superior human development outcomes at lower GDP growths. Now, I think this is what the data tells us. And this is as far as we can go in terms of deriving our experience over the last 20 years. But the more interesting question is, what do we do about it? It's one thing doing an analysis of the data, but it's another looking ahead and seeing how do we address some of these paradoxes and some of these challenges. And let me suggest to you three very important look-ahead items as far as an agenda for human development is concerned. First, I think it's very clear to anybody that public expenditures are going to be crucial. Social development or human development is not an area which is going to see PPP, which is a buzzword, you know, on a very large scale. There may well be certain niche areas where public-private partnerships may have relevance, but I think it is a consensus view amongst economists of different persuasions that public expenditures are continuing, will continue to play a crucial role in addressing human development challenges. But the question is, what is the nature of delivering that public expenditure? So far, our model has been public expenditure, public delivery. This has been our traditional model of delivering services through public expenditure. But I think a time has come for us to recognize the perhaps of the public delivery system in many parts of India, particularly in the tribal areas of our country. And we have to think differently about delivering some of these public services. Let me recall for you the example of Kerala. Kerala is often in the economics literature, thanks to K.N. Raj and Amartya Sen, we talk about the Kerala model. And the, one of the elements of the Kerala model is universal literacy, is education for all. But we never recognize the fact that 60% of all public expenditure in Kerala was through private institutions, was through institutions of the church or institutions of communities. So it was, it was public expenditure, it was public investment, but delivered through quasi-public institutions. Now, I think this is something that is bound to be controversial in our country, but we must come to grips with innovations in delivery systems. Different states have experimented with different models. The Andhra Pradesh group model. Can women's self-help groups be used on a much larger scale for the delivery of public services? Some states, like Kerala, and perhaps to an extent West Bengal, have experimented with panchayat institutions. Panchayats have now become constitutionally enshrined after the 73rd Amendment. The expectation is that public services delivered through panchayat institutions would be delivered in a more transparent and more accountable manner. Has this actually been the case is something that we need to look at. We have certain states, as I mentioned to you, Kerala, Bengal, Karnataka is another state 
which has experimented with empowering panchayat institutions for the delivery of basic public services. And now, recently, we have launched what is called the Direct Benefit Transfer Initiative, which is again an innovation in the delivery of public services. So I think the first major policy question in the human development field is recognizing persisting human development challenges, recognizing growing paradoxes of human development in a country which is experiencing rapid economic growth in spite of a blip here and there. The first recognition must be the essentiality of public expenditure, but equally the essentiality of innovation in the delivery system and introducing innovations across the board in order to get out of this fixed public expenditure, public delivery system model that we have adopted, which has led to schools being created without teachers being present, to primary health centers and sub-centers having been created without health personnel being present, with Anganwadi centers having been created, without Anganwadi workers being present. So the infrastructure having been created, but the infrastructure, outcomes expected from that infrastructure not having been delivered on a commensurate scale. The second point that I would like to highlight is the complete neglect in the human development field of sanitation. When we talk about human development in our country, we talk about education, we talk about health, we talk about water supply increasingly, but we do not recognize the centrality of sanitation. In fact, today, there is adequate medical evidence to suggest that one of the causes for persistent high levels of malnutrition in India is poor sanitation and hygiene. Now this has not yet percolated amongst economists who write on human development or even in the planning commission which allocates money across the sectors. And what I'm saying is a very, very significant medical finding. This is not an econometric finding, it's a medical finding. High levels of malnutrition because of a medical phenomenon called tropical enteropathy. High levels of malnutrition are caused by persistently poor records or performance on sanitation and hygiene. But the one area in which there has been no visible improvement is sanitation. And our track record on sanitation is pathetic, to say the least. 60% of all open defecations in the world are in our country. 60% of women in India still defecate in the open. And the, way, at the rate at which we are going is going to take us at least 10 to 15 years to make India open defecation free. So I think from a human development angle, if we want to see better outcomes on human development, if we want to see progress in unraveling some of the paradoxes that I have highlighted for you, a far greater policy and political focus on sanitation is required. Sanitation is not about building toilets or latrines alone. Sanitation is about social and community mobilization as well. And in some states of this country, particularly Maharashtra, uh, has shown the way in this approach. You re re recall the work of Sen and Drez on Kerala. The main point that they have made on Kerala is that Kerala got to where it got to on education and health because the public agenda in Kerala embraced issues relating to health and education. So these were not issues of planning or resource allocation. 
these were fundamentally political issues. These were issues that dominated the political and public discourse. And I think a time has come for us to give that role, that central role to sanitation if we want to see measurable and visible outcomes on the human development front. Thirdly, I think we need to have far greater flexibility in our approaches to deal with problems that are arising, as I have mentioned to you, in different clusters. The problem with national rebel responses, the problem with the Mahatma Gandhi Narega, which one of your students has produced a thesis on, the problem with all national level programs is a one-size-fit-all approach. It does not take into account variations in ecological conditions, variations in social conditions, deprivations of infrastructure. Initial conditions are very important when it comes to measuring outcomes. And one of the great problems, one of the great drawbacks of national level interventions is precisely this lack of flexibility. And today, we have reached a situation where we have some clearly identifiable clusters where human development indicators have lagged severely behind. And if you were to ask me if there is one group of areas which require for a completely different approach, it's the tribal districts of India, the tribal areas of India, ranging from Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, West Bengal. About 170 districts in central and eastern India, which are characterized by very poor human development indicators. And it's not a coincidence that many of these areas are Maoist affected areas also. These are all areas of tribal deprivation. These are all areas of tribal discontent, which has been used by the Maoist organizations. And we are seeing the impact of that in many of these districts. So I think to summarize, our experience in the last 20 years on economic growth has been certainly impressive. Between 1973 and 1992, GDP growth averaged 4.3% per year. And since the last conference at IGIDR, GDP growth has averaged 7% per year. There's been a very, very significant step up in economic growth. But in the last 20 years, our human development indicators, barring education, and I want to stress this, barring the education component of human development, has not shown the type of increase that we had hoped would be shown when you move to a higher growth path, which will then enable you to generate the resources required for making larger investments of dealing with human development. Not only have we lagged behind on human development, but we have also had persistent paradoxes, and I have pointed out some of these paradoxes to you. And I think as we look ahead, to a revival of the growth momentum, we need to draw these appropriate lessons from the last decade or so, the last two decades or so, and bring about innovations, as I have mentioned to you, so that our track record on delivering on human development is much better and commensurate with a rapidly growing economy. So I thought these are some of the issues that came up as I look back, in fact, I had occasion before coming here to read some of the papers that were presented. Uh, and one of the papers that I had presented at that conference was on balanced regional development uh, and issues that had been discussed at IGIDR then still make a lot of sense. Uh, because these have not, these are the hardy perennials of Indian planning. These are not those areas which are amenable to stroke of the pen reforms. These are structural issues. These are largely political issues. And I think many of the issues that were discussed 
by so many scholars, distinguished scholars from across the world uh, 20 years ago, still bear repetition right now. So let me thank uh, the governor for giving me the opportunity of coming back. Let me thank Dr. Mahindra Dev as well uh, for inviting me to be present here. Uh, and I look forward to continuing contributions from the academic community, from the students who are graduating from here. I can only end by sharing with Dr. Subarao and uh, Dr. Mahendra Dev uh, that I hope that IGIDR, you've finished, completed 25 years. And my theory of Indian institutions is that they have a half-life of about 35 years. After 35 years, they begin to fade away, they begin to lose their intellectual gravitas. And one of the great tragedies of Indian academic institutions in India, I came from one of the most premier ones yesterday, where I was yesterday, uh, and I hope that you will not fall prey to it, is parochialization. I think if you retain the national character both in the faculty and the students. I'm very glad to see a young man from Manipur uh, who has come here and got a degree. And I think if you are able to retain a sense of national character amongst both your faculty and students, I think that would be a great achievement. And uh, it would also be very, very important as planners of this institution to look ahead and create potential for intellectual leadership. I have often said that in India, the problem with mentors is they become tormentors. And I think the trick is to know to what extent to mentor and then get out and allow others to function. And I think IGIDR has been very, very fortunate so far. You've had a succession of enlightened governors of the Reserve Bank. You've had excellent directors of impeccable academic and policy standing, and I'm sure that uh, IGIDR would be an honorable exception to this rule of institutional decay, which has become so very prominent in Indian intellectual life. Thank you very much.